hearts and minds clear this morning. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm thankful for, uh, I got to officiate my nephew's uh, wedding uh, Friday. Um, he's the one with the, the really hairy children that sits out here and, and they bark a lot. Um, his name's Justin, in case you were wondering. But um, I got to uh, I got to officiate uh, their wedding Friday, and um, going to be able to officiate uh, Terry and Judas uh, this this afternoon. And uh, got a call from uh, some uh, people that are associated here for another wedding in the in the fall. Uh, so thankful for that. And um, it's not the fact that I'm thankful just for doing weddings. Uh, I'm thankful for the fact that this is. This is the first time since I've started ministry that at this point I've done more weddings than funerals. And um, I like doing weddings much more than funerals. So uh, I'm thankful uh, that uh, we haven't had too many of those thus far and uh, I pray that that continues. I know that death is just a part of life. And the Bible tells us that we're all appointed a day. Uh, and so that's, uh, I think that's why this, this, this lesson today um, has some significance there. And, and, and if you got your Bible, uh, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now this is a passage that I'm sure you've heard many times over. Anytime somebody's been talking about the end times, you've probably heard this. Anytime somebody starts talking about the rapture, I'm sure you've heard this. But I think uh, with this, this particular scripture this morning, uh, with the question that come with it, I, sometimes I think we miss things. We, we miss the overall importance of what a scripture is really saying uh, when we just start looking at some of the thoughts and interpretations behind some of these things. Now, you know, I'm not saying that uh, this, this doesn't point to a wonderful day when the Lord will come back and get us. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that there are some really important things for us here today. Some things for us to, to really take hold of here in the present. And so uh, here I want to give you the question here. It says, the dead in Christ rise first. Now, who are the dead that the Bible is talking about? Is it the people in the graves? All right, so we will address that, uh, that question. But I want to look at the whole, the whole passage of Scripture here that this is in. And this, it's almost like a parenthesis in this book because Paul is, is talking to the, the Thessalonians about things that they had already been taught, but this one section, he's giving them new teaching. Now, we don't know why he's addressing this. We know that there was some false teaching going on in that day, and we do know that he was speaking and, and starting churches in, in a Greco-Roman society, so he had to deal with that aspect of it. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans, they had different views of the afterlife. And so some of the people here in the church were having questions or perhaps were having some doubts about what was to come because of some in their own family who had passed away. And of course, Jesus had taught that there was going to be a day coming when, when He would come back. And, and Paul had talked about there was a day when Jesus was going to come back. And, and of course, Christians were looking forward to that day. We're still looking forward to that day when He physically comes back. And what a day that will be. Amen. But there's some important things here that I think we just we we need to look at because we we just kind of miss them because we get to arguing about when events are going to take place, when the rapture is going to take place, when the tribulation is going to take place. You know, how is it going to be before, or after, middle? Is there going to be one at all? Because some people say, well, it's just a spiritual matter. And I think you know, we, we, it's fun to talk about those things and study those things, but I think sometimes we miss the importance of what he was talking about right then and something that can help us right now. So we're going to look at this, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And beginning in verse 13, he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, 
That you may not grieve as others. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, I, I think right here, addressing this, obviously... Um, talking about a sleep here. Sleep, obviously, those are those who have, who have already died. You know, that was just a way that they would use that terminology. And, and it, it really wasn't used that way until uh, uh, Christianity started using it as a term uh, of sleep. And, and the Greek word there is where we get our word cemetery from. Um, but he's talking about, he didn't want them to be uninformed. So obviously, he was addressing an issue of where people were trying to inform them of something different than what he had taught. Something different that was a, a different gospel. Because if you remember in some of his other writings, Paul had said, if you hear someone preaching a, dif a different gospel, if you hear someone preaching a different Jesus, then you need to be on guard. You need to be listening. And so obviously we've got some people here who are interjecting some thoughts. And so, you know, the, the, the Greeks, they had different ideas about the afterlife. Most of them thought that there, there might have been a, a, a very shadowy, gloomy afterlife, and they had thoughts about uh, physical matter and spiritual matter, and so they had all these different types of belief, uh, all these different types of gods, and so, of course, they could have been interjecting their own thoughts, and then new, new Christians who, were just, who had just became Christians, baby Christians, of course, they've got questions. So how... how? How do we address this? So Paul's addressing this. He said, I just don't want you to be uninformed. And so he proceeds to inform them. But he says, about those who are asleep, those who have died, those that you're concerned about, he said, I don't want you to grieve as those do who have no hope. And I think there's a lot that's said there about those who have died. Now, in that culture, it was appropriate, especially with the Greeks, because they thought a philosophical view that they had was that there had to be an appropriate amount of grieving. The, at times, they would, also, they would hire people to come in and grieve. That was not uncommon in that day. And so, you know, some people try and say, well, this is what it's talking about. Paul's talking about, look, there's something different there. There's something I want you to be informed about. There are those who have no hope. He's talking about those who, have, who don't have Jesus in their life. Because that's what he's really pointing at here. He's pointing at the hope in Jesus Christ. Because, I mean, look around. Where do you find hope at? Some people find it in different things. But is it really hope? It's not. And so he's, he's addressing him and said, Look, I got something for you. Let me inform you about something better. About those that you're concerned about. Those who have went on. Those in the Lord. For he continues in verse 14. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So he's saying, hey, look, let, let me share some wonderful news with you. Your folks that have went on, those that have passed on before you, because some folks believe that they had missed the resurrection because there were folks that were passing before Jesus had come back. And so they were, they were maybe confused, they had questions, and Paul said, hey, look, don't fret. I've got good news for you. Those that have passed on, those that have died in the Lord, because we believe that Jesus has risen from the dead, you can rest assured because He told us we shall rise from the dead. Amen? Now that sounds better than a gloomy afterlife living in the shadows, doesn't it? Not knowing which God or that God you'll have to answer to. It's pretty concrete. So you're not going to have to grieve like others because you have hope. Because we believe Jesus rose, we also believe that we shall rise. You shall rise in Christ. And not only that, he's addressing the issue about those who have went on. 
He said, in that time, not only will you not have to grieve like those who have no hope, but God will bring with Him those who have already went. What a great reunion. How many is looking for a great reunion of some loved ones? I can't wait to see my firstborn Jesse. One day wasn't enough. I'm ready to see him. I'm ready to see my dad. I'm ready to see my grandma. And other relatives that I don't even know I had. I'm ready to see him, but more importantly, I'm ready to see Jesus. Amen. Amen. Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> So he's given us something to give us hope. He's giving something that we can believe in. Because you know, people are looking for something to believe in today, aren't they? I mean, belief in all kinds of stuff that just does not make sense, but they're trying their best. Bless their little hearts. But we've got something good and concrete. Because remember Paul, he talked about many times, he said, look, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then what we're doing is in vain. If He didn't rise from the dead, then everybody's here today. What you doing here? There's no point in it. But He's saying, but that ain't the case, folks. He did rise. And Paul should know. Paul seen Him. On the road to Damascus, Paul had that wonderful encounter with Jesus. And he really had a come to Jesus moment. How many of you have had them have that come to Jesus moment? I hope y'all have. But he did. He had that come to Jesus moment on the road to Damascus and forever his life was changed and it was in that moment that he realized that there was hope. He realized that there was something better. He realized that there was much more to believe in. And he wanted to share that with others. Because you know, sometimes when significant people in your life move on from this life to the next, some people are just, they're just plain lost, aren't they? Sometimes people just grieve and grieve and grieve, and they never really get over that grief. And I think, you know, this, this is a wonderful scripture to help each of us, because, you know, we all, we all deal with grief in a different way. But the Bible gives us some hope that, you know, we don't have to grieve like people who don't know how to grieve. People who grieve in things that they don't understand. We understand this. We understand that, that Jesus has, has risen. That's, that should be enough for us to jump for joy. He's risen. But we get to do that too. We're going to rise one day. And so that brings us joy. But not only that, He's going to bring with those who've already went on. So we get to jump for joy for that. So there's so much to be thankful for. And we're not even through this passage yet. Now, verse 15, he tells them, he said, look, here, here's, here's where my source of information is coming to you. In verse 15, he says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. That means he got that from the Lord. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So here's where we get to the meat of this question about the dead in Christ. Those who are left, those who are alive, the Christians at this time. Will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now this was something a little different that he was teaching. Because he was teaching about bodily resurrection as well. So, you know, he's already talked about, he's taught about the soul. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, they had different ideas about that. The Jews, they had some different, a little bit different ideas about that. But as Christians were concerned, they had a little bit different approach. And Paul talked about that. Paul had talked about how when a person dies, that in that moment, if they're Christian, if, they're sla if they are saved by the blood of the Lamb, that in that moment, that very moment, 
when their soul is no longer in their body, they are present with the Lord. And so he's already addressed that, but we got to deal with what's that, that body that's there. And so they had, the, the Greeks real, had a real problem with matter, with physical stuff. And see, Jesus had taught and Paul had taught, the other apostles taught that there was going to be a time when the body and, and, and that soul were going to come back together in a new body. That means looking forward to that. How many, how many woke up with aches and pains this morning? How many is hurting right now? So we're all, we're all looking forward to this time when, when we're not hurting, when there's something in us that is just not popping or cracking or just aching constantly. We're looking forward to that day. And there's going to be a day where our, our, our physical body that's gone on and is laying in the dirt, there's a day when that's going to be resurrected and we're going to have that new body. Now think back when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He gave them a glimpse of what this new body might look at. When He came back and said, Hey, look, look, look right here. Look at, that, look at that, nice, that nice hole right there. But He showed them a glorified body that they would one day have. Because Paul talked about it. He said, look, he said one day Jesus is going to come back. Not only is He going to come back, but we're going to be able to see Him as He really is, and we shall be like Him. How many, how many of you ready to take a lap right now? We're going to be like Jesus. I'm looking forward to that day. But He's trying to tell them and give them the information. said, don't worry about the afterlife. Because your soul's taken care of if you love Jesus. If you accept Him as Lord, your soul's taken care of. But guess what? That body's going to be taken care of too. Because the Greeks, they, they believed in a disembodied spirit. You know, like Casper or something like that. That ain't going to be it at all. The Bible don't talk like that. The Bible says that we're going to have a resurrected body. A new body, a new creation. Oh man, I'm looking forward to it. In verse 16. Now listen here. Man, it just keeps getting better. It says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So here, here's that dead in Christ. Those who have, who have already gone, God bless them, their soul has departed in, in the presence of the Lord. Their bodies, that new body is about to get resurrected. Man, that's going to be awesome. But it says the Lord Himself. He ain't sending somebody else. It says the Lord Himself will initiate this. With that cry, that loud command with the voice of an archangel. And that sound of that trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So he's dealing with their question about where they are, that bodily resurrection. So he's dealt with the soul. Now he's dealing with the body. Now there's a question of who's left. Well, that includes us, my friends. We're the ones who's left. In verse 17, he says, Then we who are alive, who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Hallelujah! How many of you can get an amen on that one? See, this is cause for enjoyment. This is cause for excitement. See, I think this is what I was saying. I think we get too caught up. We get too caught up in the idea of talking about the rapture and, and, and arguing about when it's going to come. Now, I just talked about last week how uh, time was different for God. God exists outside of time. So time's not really important to Him. He's long-suffering. Time's important to us, but it's not to Him. Because He started time and He's going to end time. And furthermore... There's people who try to say, you know what? I know when that day's going to be. I think you ought to tell them, say, hey, here's a good, 
you know, normally I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this, but I think this is a good time you can tell somebody, you know what, you're wrong. Right. Let me show you in the Word. Because right here where it says Jesus said, he don't know. So we spend time, as fun as it is, as exciting as it is, to talk about when Jesus is going to come back, what time it's going to be. That's all great and everything. But we don't know. We honestly don't know. But we're going to be called up together. Now, I, I, I really like this phrase because this is, this is where we get that word rapture from. The Greek words harpazo. And then we get the Latin word rapturo from that, which is where we get our English word rapture from. So the word rapture, if you get to looking for it, it ain't there. But if you go looking in the Latin Bible, that's where we get it from. But that phrase, being caught up, that means snatched away by force. Pulled out of there. Now, I'm looking forward to that. Because think about the darkness and the evil that we're surrounded with and being snatched away by God Himself. It's not somebody else. It's God. God initiates this. He's going to pull us out from the depths of hell. Amen. Are you looking forward to that day? I am. Not only are we going to be caught up and snatched away from there, it says we're going to meet them. There's that grand reunion. We're going to meet them. Meeting Jesus. Meeting the saints of old. Meeting our loved ones. You know there's going to be a big feast after that. You know we like to eat, don't we? So we got so much to look forward to. It doesn't matter when it's coming. Because Jesus never, never put any emphasis on the timing of when He came. Or when He was going to come. He never did that. But I'll tell you what He did put emphasis on. About being ready when He does. And I think far too many people... And I have to admit, at, at one point in my life, I was more worried about the other. I, I was more worried about when he's coming back, that timing, when the rapture's going to take place, when the tribulation is, how all that falls together. And I realized, you know what? That don't matter. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that I'm ready because he's going to come and snatch us like a thief in the night. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you better be ready. You better be saved by the blood of the Lamb. You better know who Jesus is. Not just know Him, you better love Him and believe in Him and have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Because I want to be with Him. I want to be with my loved ones. And I want to be with the saints of old. Just think about being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Being able to look upon that face who saved me by His grace. Can you imagine it? That's why I can only say what a day that'll be because what other words can we put there? We don't even know how to describe it. We can't, we can't imagine the joy and excitement. Now, Generally, when you talk about death and losing people, there's always some kind of sorrow there. But look to what he says. Now, I mean, look at all the excitement that we've had thus far. I'm sweating up a storm up here. It's not just because it's hot. It's because the Lord has said some amazing things. These are not my words. These are His. These are His words. He says this. He's coming back. He's going to get us. We're going to be reunited. We're going to be gathered as a family, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as heirs to the promise that was promised to Abraham. But this last verse, here's something we're not doing enough of. 
He says, therefore, and that word therefore means look at the other verses before this. Go back to verse 13 and start reading again. So therefore, start at 13 and read through there again. He says, encourage one another with these words. How many of us are encouraging each other that there's hope, that we have this belief that Christ has risen, He's coming again, He's bringing our loved ones, and glory, hallelujah, we will forever be with the Lord. Amen? That sounds encouraging to me. I want to encourage you. Jesus loves you so much. And He's going to come. He's going to come. There ain't nothing we can do to stop it. He's going to come. But He wants you to be ready. I know He's probably spoken. He's spoken to you. He's whispered to you, I love you. Some, some of you, He's yelled at. I know I'm one of them. <laughs> he yells at me a lot. But He loves you. And, he, and when He comes back, he, He's wanting all of you to be one of those ones that come and meet Him. You know, the, part of, part of the, the idea of being called away and going out to meet Him has has the essence of going out to meet royalty. How many of you have met royalty? I've met some people who thought they were important. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of people who think they're important. But this is saying anybody. Because anybody on this earth that says they're royal is nothing in comparison to true royalty that's coming. So think about that. He, he's, he's wanting us to be ready so that we can go and meet true royalty. And not just that, to accept us as royalty as well. Because Paul promised, he said, just as Jesus is, you see Him as He is, we shall be like Him. And the Word has promised we are heirs with Him. Does that not encourage you today? Does that not give you some hope to go encourage somebody else today? People need hope. And He addressed this to people who were having that image or that vision of, of hopelessness. And we know a lot of people like that. But we know that Jesus brings hope. We know that He is hope. He is the fulfillment of hope. I'm telling you today, with this final word, it's not the catching away that is most important here, but rather the gathering unto our Lord for all eternity. being with the Lord for all eternity. What a day that'll be. Let's stand for a closing prayer. Lord, we glorify you today. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to read your word to be able to read the encouragement that was left to us, that, that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write down so that we could read it and that we could be encouraged. Lord, we've all lost loved ones. Lord, we, we, we all know that many of our loved ones, Lord, they, they loved you. They loved you so much, Lord, and we know that they're with you. And Lord, the, this passage here today that we looked at and many, many others. Lord, they, they bring us the, the ultimate fulfillment of hope in You. We know that if we love You and accept You as our Savior, Lord, we, we know that there's going to be that day when You come and get us and You take us. Lord, we don't have to worry 
about that time, Lord, about that darkness, about that evil anymore, Lord. We don't have to worry about sin, Lord. You've taken care of all of it, Lord. We know that you've defeated it already. But Lord, we will be in your presence forevermore. I don't know what's more encouraging. What a glorious day that'll be when it's your face that we see. Lord, on those days of doubt, Lord, encourage us with these words. Lord, if we have the opportunity, let us encourage others with these words as you you have instructed these people here and as your word continues to instruct us here today. Lord, let us continue to work for the kingdom until that glorious day in which you come back. And Lord, let us all be ready. Let us all be ready to go. Let us have our bags packed and ready to go, but let us work until you get here. And let us reach many, many others, Lord, so that they might be able to go to. Lord, we love you, and we look forward to that day. Thank you so much for giving us of your Son and for saving us from our sins and for you rising so that we could rise too. Lord, be with each person here today. Bless them. Lord, be with our nation. Lord, And we look forward for your return. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.